Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Friday morning, Erev Shabbat Kodesh, Perashat Bemidbar. And uh, today's class has been sponsored anonymously for the Refuah Shalaman protection of all of Am Israel. If anybody would like to sponsor a class, please email us info at ejsny.org. We are studying Perashat Bemidbar. And um, the Torah, Perashat, tells us about how the Jewish people traveled and how they camped around the Mishkan. The Mishkan was the house of God. It was in the middle. And then you had three tribes on each side. Three, six, nine, twelve. And then you had the tribe of Levi itself was divided. And they, they, they lived, they dwelled, they traveled in, uh, in between the, the Jewish people and the Mishkan. So there were three zones. There was the Mishkan zone. Then there was the Levi zone, and then there was the Israel zone, okay? So the Mishkan in the middle, then immediately around them was the Leviim, and then around them was the entire Jewish people. Now, when the Leviim, the Leviim's job, by the way, was to carry the different parts of the Mishkan whenever they traveled, okay? So the Kohanim would disassemble, the Kohanim would wrap up the vessels, then they would call the Leviim to come. Leviim would come and they would carry all the different vessels. And we know that there were th mainly three families for the Leviim, right? Actually, the tribe Levi, Yaakov had a son. His name was Levi. Levi had three children. Gershon, Kehat, Merari. Okay? Know that. It's important to know our, our history. Gershon, Kehat, Merari. Okay? Kehat had four children, Amram, Yitzhar, Hebron, Uziel. Okay, so Kehat had four children. One of them was Amram. We know Amram because Amram's children was Moshe and Aharon and Miriam. Okay, so that's where Moshe falls in. And Aharon is the Kohen and all his kids are Kohanim. But everyone else in the family is not a Kohen. Moshe wasn't a Kohen. A good trivia question. You ready? Ask, um, ask your family on Shabbat table this week. How could you have, who was in history, they were a Kohen, but their full biological brother, 100%, wasn't a Kohen? What's the answer? Aharon and Moshe. Aharon was a Kohen. His full brother, Moshe, was not a Kohen. Because the Kehuna began by Aharon. Okay, brilliant. Very interesting. So, um, the, the rest of the family that are not Kohanim, they're Leviim, okay? Um, in a way, every Kohen is also a Levi, because they come from that family of Leviim. But not every Levi is a Kohen. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so, so the, the rest of the family, the regular Leviim, there was Gershon, Kehat, Merari. Now, who's the oldest of the three? Gershon. So who's the one that should be mentioned first when the Torah this week in Perashat Damidbar describes the different positions of the Leviim and what each one is to carry? Who should be first? Very good. Gershon. But that's not the case. Instead, chapter 4, the Pasuk says, Count the sons of Kehat. The Torah in, uh, begins in our Perashat with the second family, the family of Kehat. So where is the family of Gershon? Actually, next week. We don't get to it this week. Parasha ends. It was going to be too long, I guess. They ended the parasha. And instead, we begin next week with a new count, with a new family. The first one, the oldest brother of Gershon. And then Merari. Okay? So the three siblings, Gershon, Kehat, Merari, are divided into two separate parashiyot. Kehat is this week. And then Gershon and Merari is next week. So question number one, why is it out of order? Why do we put Kehat first? And question two, why put the next two brothers in next week's Perasha? Why not begin Gershon and Merari this week? Right? We should have put all the three brothers and their responsibilities in one Perasha. I mean, there's not a lot more Pesukim, by the way. It's not like we would have had to have another 100 Pesukim. Maybe 30 more? We could afford 30 more Pesukim. No? 45? Whatever it is. I mean, it's, it's true. It's a long Perashah, but next week's even longer. So what's, what's going on over here? 
that uh, the perasha A puts Kehat first, and B, it puts Gershon and Merari next week. And actually, each question answers the other as follows. The reason Kehat is first is because we have to look at what Kehat's responsibilities were. What is Kehat's responsibility? What did Kehat carry in the desert? What did they carry specifically? Which vessels? And the Pasuk says, chapter 4, this week's perasha, that they carried the Aaron, they carried the Shulchan, right? They carried the Holy Ark. The Ark is, represents Torah. The Ark represents Kavod HaTorah, honoring the Torah and those who study it and those who support it. And in Judaism, Talmud Torah Keneget Kulam. Torah is the most important value. Okay? Torah is Talmud Torah Keneget Kulam. You put all the mitzvot on one scale, you put Torah on the other. Torah is equal to all everything else. Whatever that means, maybe it needs to be understood, but, it's, but it, is a, it is a statement, it's a concept. The Torah is keneged kulam. And that's, that's true. And therefore, we must give kavod to the Torah. We give kavod to kehat. They're the ones that are carrying it. We talk about them first. That make sense? By the way, you should know. Um, we have, going up to the Torah, every day, three people on Monday and Thursday, and then on Shabbat. Who goes up first? Who goes up first? Who's the first person to get an aliyah? Kohen. Then Levi, then Israel. So there's a hierarchy system, right? There's Kohen, they go first, okay? Now, what if you have chief rabbi? Kohen or the rabbi? The answer is the rabbi. Talmud Torah, Torah corresponds to everything. By the way, this is something that I witnessed personally weekly. When I lived in Israel, I used to go pray by the house of one of the greatest giants that ever lived, Hacham Ovadiah Yosef, Halava Shalom. And Hacham Ovadiah would always get the first Aliyah. He wasn't a Kohen. He wasn't a Levi. He was a good old Israel. But they would say, Af al pi sheyesh kan Kohanim, even though there are Kohanim present in the room, Ya'amod morenu verabenu, let our rabbi, our teacher stand up and get the first Aliyah. Every single time. He would get Aliyah, he would get the first Aliyah. Because Kohan is, Kohan is nice, but Torah is even nicer. Okay? And therefore, Kehat is, a, uh, is, is, is big, is, is very important. They're the ones carrying the Aron, and therefore we have to give them the respect. We give them first mentioning. The problem is that Gershon is also is important. Gershon also... Gershon also needs to be mentioned first. Because Gershom is important. Gershom is where the Torah is from. Gershom, excuse me, is the firstborn. Gershon is the Bechor. Bechor is a value in Judaism. So here we're kind of in a conundrum. We're stuck. We don't know what to do. On the one hand, you have uh, Torah. But you also have firstborn. Only one could go first, right? Wrong. This is the beauty of our Torah. Our Torah says, listen, we got to give respect to the Torah. Torah is going to go first. But it doesn't mean that we should put other values and put the Bechor all the way down and make it zero. We should still find a way to accommodate the other value of firstborn. So what do we do? Only one could go first. The answer is we find a way to give Gershon also first. What do we give Gershon? The first of next week's perasha. So Kehat overall is mentioned first. But when you begin perasha, Naso, opening words of next week's perasha, Naso et Rosh Bene Gershon. And this is such a powerful, powerful lesson that in life, um, just because we value one thing, it doesn't mean that we, could, that we automatically must put down other values. Two things could be true at once. And yes, sometimes there is going to be an argument between two values that we have, and one will have to override, but it doesn't mean to completely ignore or degrade the other value. Yes, Gershon must come second. Kehat is the Torah. He's the one that we're going to put first. 
but let's try to figure out a way to accommodate Gershom and also give him the first. Why wasn't Gershom given the kavod of carrying the Aron is a good question, not for now. Excellent question, not for now. But whatever the reason is, Gershon wasn't given the Torah. But we're still going to treat them with respect. To the contrary, by the way. The more we are rooted in Torah, the more we are sensitive to the values of other people. And just look at the current events. Here is the, uh, here is the IDF, and they're f- faced with this decision. What do we do? You have all these terrorists that are shooting rockets aimlessly towards Israel. And they don't care who they hit. They don't care if they hit the army base or if they hit innocent little children. It's irrelevant to them. They are shooting rockets, one and the same, everywhere, wherever. By the way, you should know many of these rockets landed in Gaza. And then you have all the fake news showing these pictures as if it was Israel that was, that was the one, ones responsible for it. And, and, and now we're stuck. What do we do? We want, Israel could easily, by the way, 100, 100 uh, uh, jets, bomb, bomb the entire Gaza. It's over in five minutes. Five minutes, the entire story is over. See you later. Go home. Not a single soldier or Jew has to die. But there's innocent people. And there's civilians. And we don't want to kill innocent, even though they're Arabs. We feel the, that, they're, that life is valuable for everybody. And so Israel is risking their own people, their own soldiers, to try to minimize the amount of deaths that they have to cause to innocent Arabs. They sent warning signs into Gaza. You should know we're going to bomb this building. You have five minutes to evacuate. And what do the terrorists do? They shoot rockets from hospitals. They shoot rockets from kindergartens. They shoot rockets from innocent places because they know that if the, if the Jews are going to bomb us, to destroy the the, uh, the the site. If they're going to try to destroy the site of where the rockets are coming from, they're going to have to kill a hospital, destroy a hospital, and it's going to make Israel look bad. They do it on purpose. They don't care about their citizens. They're terrorists. Israel cares. So this is something that we get from the Torah. That yes, we have values. Yes, we protect our, but we're not going to do it at the expense as well of killing innocent Arabs either. This is the beauty of our Torah, and it's the the, the saddest thing. The saddest thing, the biggest chaval, the biggest shame, is that the world manipulates it the complete other direction. And you have all of these dangerous people out there, not only Hamas and terrorists, you have these dangerous bloggers and Instagrammers and all these other influential people that are just as dangerous, if not even more, that could say things like, listen, we have to see... Who, which side has more deaths? I don't know. It's not so simple. And complete lies, feeding it out to the world. Because of people like that, by the way, people in Times Square get attacked. Because of people that are spreading all this shit and nonsense to the world, you have all this hate going on. And, and the, the, Torah, the, the Torah reminds us that we have to be sensitive to all the values and try to accommodate everything at the same exact time. There is an amazing story, by the way, of Rabbi Yisrael Salanter. Uh, he was, it was such an amazing story. Again, it encapsulates the entire theme of what we're saying. He was once at, um, at an inn. And as he's about to walk in, there's another rabbi walking in at the same exact time. Now, what happens when you have two rabbis walking into a room at the same time? There's this uh, ping pong religious ping pong match that goes on where each rabbi says to the next Bechavod, Rabbi, you go ahead. And he says, no, 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 you go ahead. No, chas v'shalom, please, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. And you have to play this four or five times until finally one says, okay, let's go together, right? It's like a whole beautiful, humble humility game that they play to show, I don't want respect, you take it. No, I don't want it. No, you take it. Okay, this is unwritten rule. That you have to like, you know, four, five, five, sh- five times. Anyways, Rabbi Yisrael Salanter is walking into this inn. And this other uh, rabbi says, uh, Rabbi Salanter sees the other man, he says, Bechavon. And the other rabbi says, no, 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 Rabbi, please, you go first. And Rabbi Yisrael Salanter said, okay. And he went in. And the, the other rabbi was a little bit bothered. 
He was puzzled. He said, I, I don't understand. You know, right, right after the first offer you went in, you accepted right away. That's not usually how this game works. Usually you're supposed to keep the match alive for four or five shots until you hit a winner. Here, Rabbi Sorosh Salanta, right away, he aced him. Well, what's going on? And Rabbi Sorosh Salanta noticed that this man was a little bit puzzled. And he says to the guy, he says, listen, I know, I, I see that you're a little bit bothered that I accepted your first invite to enter into the, into the, in, into the door before you. And, um, and I'll explain to you why. I, go, I want you to go first because I believe that you should get the respect. And you want me to go first because you believe that I should get the respect. And they're both beautiful, and that's true. But it's the winter. And as we were holding the door arguing, all the cold air was going into the inn, causing everybody inside inconvenience, making them cold and uncomfortable. Just because you and I are arguing on kavod, it doesn't mean that they should suffer. This is the balance of the values that these gedolim have. They understood, yes, I got to respect, I got to do, but not at the expense of other people. And you know what? We find this theme right here, again in our parasha, chapter 18, uh, chapter 4, Pasuk 18. Take a look at Pasuk 18. After God commands Moshe to tell Kehat that they're going to carry these vessels, he then says to him, Al tachritu, do not let the tribe of Kehat be cut off from among the Levites. Wow. Don't let them be cut off. Why would they be cut off? Why would the family of Kehat get destroyed? The Midrash says something remarkable. The Midrash says, because what is Kehat carrying? They're carrying different vessels. One of them is the Aaron. Take a guess what every single person wanted to carry. Everyone wanted to carry what? The Aaron. But obviously, when you have many people in only one position, only one person could carry it or four people, whatever it is, but it's limited in how many people could have that honor, there's going to be argument. There's going to be fighting, and each one's going to start pushing and shoving. And the Gemara tells us an interesting story. You know, there's a mitzvah in the Beit HaMikdash. Anyone know what was the first mitzvah done every single morning in the temple? Let's see if you guys can get this one. What was the first job done in the Beit HaMikdash? It was a mitzvah called Terumat HaDeshen, where they would clean the ashes from the Mizbeach from last night. Okay? Well, ha who got to do this? It was actually a race. They would race the first one up. The Gemara tells us one time there was a race, and the two Kohanim were head to head. And they got closer and closer and they realized that it's going to be a tie. And so what did one of them do? He pushed the other one off the ramp. And he fly, he flew off and he landed and he got very injured. Because he wanted to go and do a mitzvah. And the lesson is that sometimes we get so distracted by the mitzvah, we lose sight of the bigger picture. We forget what is the purpose of the Beit HaMikdash? The purpose is shalom. The purpose is to unite the people. To go out and push someone, is that really what Hashem wants? That I should destroy someone so that I could carry? Is that really the goal of the year? And sometimes we get carried away when we're doing something, especially when what we're doing is L'Shem Shamaim. When what we're doing is for Hashem, we could go very, very, very bad things. We can get very distracted and completely lose our sense of value sometimes. And over here, the family of Kehat's going to want to carry the Aaron and each one's going to fight and forget what they're fighting for. At a certain point, you're just fighting. You don't even know why you're fighting. I just, I got to win. But one second, why do you want to win? Why, do you, why are you carrying the Aaron? What does the Aaron represent? What is the Torah all about? It's about peace and love. You're going to kill someone so that you can carry the peace and loving Torah? Does that make any sense? It doesn't make sense unless you're in the race. And then, you, then it does make sense because you forget. So as an example, the custom is that when someone passes away, the family members say Kaddish, right? And they say Kaddish for a year, 11 months, whatever it is. They say Kaddish. 
And what is the goal of Kaddish? The goal of Kaddish is that I say, Itkadal shemer Let the name of God be great. And everyone answers, Amen. And then I say again, Be'alma, continue. And then everyone answers in unison, shemer Let everyone, let, let God's name be great everywhere. And I create an awareness of the greatness and oneness of God to an entire community of 10 people plus. That is a mitzvah that's going to all go to the account that's going to be accrued to the account of the deceased. The deceased is causing the Kaddish to be said. Now in Shamaim, he's going to be elevated from one level to the next, to the next, to the next. The story in the Gemara, right? What's the, what's the source of Kaddish? Anyone know the source? Here's the story. Gemara says in Masechet Kala. There was once a man, his name was Rabbi Akiva. You should all know him. Okay, Rabbi Akiva was walking and he sees this man who was very, very dark. Black man, black, completely black. And uh, he's, he looks burned. He's going and chopping wood and ash and, and, and chopping trees to make wood. And Rabbi Akiva sees this man, he's sweating and he's all filled with soot and he's dark and burnt. He's wondering, where is this guy from? And I'm going to saw him around. What's he running to do? Where's the rush? He says, Mister, where are you running? He says, Shh, shh, leave me alone. I don't have time. I don't have time. Stay away. Go away. Go away. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Take it easy. What, what, what's going on? Where are you from? What, 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 where are you rushing to? He's like, ah, stay away. Stay away. He's like, well, you're acting, you're acting like a demon. You're acting like a, like a, like a monster. So the man says, how do you know? How did you know that? So Rabbi Akiva says, what do you mean? How did I know what? How did you know that I was a demon? How did you know that I'm a monster? How did you know that I'm not from this world? And the man goes on to tell Rabbi Akiva, I'm not from this world. I'm a neshama. I'm a soul. And the Gemara tells us, this man tells Rabbi Akiva that he actually lived regular life a few decades ago, but he passed away. And when he, gets to, when he got to Shamaim, there was no way to find this man any good in him. He says, I sinned. I fed people not kosher. I cheated. I lied. I did the worst sins. And Shamaim found me guilty. And my punishment is every single day I have to come down to this world and chop the wood that they use to burn me on. Now again, Rabbi Akiva saw this. It was definitely on a higher level. Definitely, you're not going to see it with our amateur eyes. Rabbi Akiva says to this man, listen, I want to help you. Do you have anyone in your family that's alive? He says, listen, I have one son. He's, he says, okay, where city did he come from? He tells him he came from so-and-so. He, that's where I used to live. And what's your wife's name? He tells him. He says, okay. Rabbi Akiva travels all the way to the town. He finds the people. He says, listen, you ever heard of a man so-and-so? So they say, oh my God, don't say that name. The guy was the biggest rasha. The guy was the worst person ever. Don't say such a name, horrible name. Don't say it. Get it out of here. How about his wife? You ever heard of his wife? Oh! God, his wife even worse than him. Oh, yeah, yeah. He stopped saying these words, these horrible names. How about his son? Do you know his son? Oh my God, his son be worse than all of them. Well, where can I find his son? Where can you find his son? Probably you can find his son by uh, the worst place in the town. Go to the worst, go to a brothel, you'll find his son. Okay. He goes around, he finds the guy's son. He says, listen, are you so-and-so? He says, yes. Okay. Um, are you, um, you know, do you, do you know how to pray? He says, pray, I have no idea. I don't know how to read. Rabbi Kiva brings this kid. He teaches him how to read. He teaches him how to learn. It's a process. It was a long process, but he teaches him. Finally, eventually this kid learns. He says, okay, now come read Kaddish. The kid says Kaddish. And that night the man comes to Rabbi Akiva and he is clean. And he's smiling and he says, Rabbi Akiva, thank you. You saved my soul. One Kaddish from my child elevated me to levels that I could never fathom. That's one Kaddish. So we say Kaddish. And the goal of the Kaddish is to be Aliyat Neshama, to elevate the soul of the deceased. Right? 
because we're creating a Kiddush Hashem in this world. That's what Kaddish means, Kiddush Hashem, to elevate God's name. Now what happens? You have sometimes, there's something called a Chiyuv, an obligation. That someone has an obligation, they want to pray for the Chazan, Ashkenazim, very important to them, that they pray Chazan whenever they're in the year of a lost parent. They pray. They want to be Chazan. That's called a Chiyuv. But what happens if you have sometimes two people that have a Chiyuv? Two people are now fighting for this. Only one could be Chazan. So sometimes one says, okay, I'll pray in a different minyan. But sometimes it's unfortunate, but you see them fighting. I was here first. No, I was in the back. No, I saw you walk in. No, it was me. And each one, and they start causing fighting and machloket. And if you just take a step back and you ask them, hello, what are you fighting over? So what do you mean? I want to say Kaddish. What is Kaddish doing? What is it for? What's the purpose? To elevate God's name. You think you're making an elevation right now by fighting with another Jew in front of all of these people? You're making a chilul Hashem. You're desecrating Hashem's name. But sometimes we get so focused on the, on the here and the now and the mitzvah. We forget about the bigger picture. We can't lose sight. Don't push a guy off because you're trying to go do a, a mitzvah. Don't double park because you want to go pray. It's not what Hashem wants. Don't block somebody in their driveway because you want to go do a mitzvah of prayer. Go pray alone. We cannot sometimes let one value just destroy all the other values that we have. That's not what the point of the Torah is. The lesson, yes, kehat is important, but also gershon is important. We're going to make sure to preserve his dignity. We're going to give him the first, but he can't be the first because he's not a Torah. Gershon, a Torah is first. You're right, but we're going to find a way to give him first. How? We're going to give him first of next week's perasha. We're going to push him off to a new perasha, and he's going to begin perasha naso. By Pam, he used to speak about this, and he gave a beautiful example. Sometimes you have a, a couple that wants to go do a mitzvah of going to a wedding. Is that a nice mitzvah? Beautiful mitzvah? Simchat chatan vekala, making the chatan and kala happy. There's almost nothing nicer than that, right? To make chatan and kala, to dance for them. It's a beautiful mitzvah. But what happens? They have little kids and someone's got to watch them. So they ask their elderly parents, could you uh, watch our children for us? And the parents say, no problem. And besimcha happily. And they drop them off. But they get carried away at the wedding and they're dancing and they stay till 10 p.m., 11 p.m., 12 p.m. And their elderly parents who go to sleep every night at 9, 9 p.m. or 10 p.m., now they're up with a crying baby and all these children that are jumping all over them till midnight. For what? Because the kids want to do a mitzvah of chatan and kala, of dancing for the bride and groom. Yes, it's a nice mitzvah to dance for the bride and groom. But not if it's going to come at the expense of hurting your elderly parents. Of course, I'm just giving an example. If your parents don't mind and they explicitly tell you to go, every, always there's exceptions, there's different cases. I'm not saying as a rule. I'm just giving an example how sometimes we can forget that uh, I'm doing one mitzvah here, but it's going to cause someone else pain over there. That's maybe not what the Torah wants. Another example he used to give. Um, wife makes husband. Uh, wife, <laughs> wife doesn't make husband. Wife makes supper for her husband. And she's very excited. Her husband's going to come home and taste a beautiful dinner. 6 p.m. He's supposed to arrive. He's not home. 6.30. 7. 7.30. Now today you have a cell phone. But uh, back then you didn't have a cell phone. What do you do? He's at home, 9 o'clock. He finally walks in at 9 o'clock. The wife is filled with anxiety. She's freaking out. She doesn't know where her husband is. He finally comes home and she says, Where were you? What took what, 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 you three hours late? He says, No, honey, I'll tell you. A man came over to me. He needed a lift to the airport. I went to do a mitzvah to take him to the airport. What would you say? Mitzvah? Kimilut chasadim? It's a nice thing. Is it a good thing that he did, that he took someone to the airport? It is a nice thing, but at the expense of your wife being filled with anxiety for three hours, not knowing where you are, right? So again, to have the sensitivity, to be able to consider all our options, 
whenever we're making choices and decisions in life. We, we must follow the Torah. We must follow the Torah. And, and the Torah is the one that dictates for us which values are more important. To never let one override the other. Again, we're about to get the Torah, Shavuot. We have two halves to the, to the Luchot. We have the Torah, Shebikht, we have the Ben Adam Makom. We have the Ben Adam Chavero. We have the mitzvot that are meant to God. We have the mitzvot that are primarily man to man. And our rabbis tell us that the Luchot, the Pasuk says Luchot, it's written as if it's one, Luchat. It's written as if it's a singular, even though we read it plural. Why? To tell us, says the Midrash, that they were like one. The two tablets were equal in size. Imagine two sides of this book. Each one, if you measure it, exactly the same exact as the other half. The same exact size. And the message here is that they're the same size, meaning that both luchot, the right half that speaks about man to God, and the left half that speaks about man to man, should be the same size. They're both equally important. It is not for us to decide, oh, you know what? I think this one's more important. I'm going to do it. Or I think that one's more important. I'm going to do it. They're equally important. The Torah tells us which one overrides which, in which situation. We follow the Torah. We have the Torah guiding us throughout our lives. And they're equally valuable to us. And we must never belittle one value over another. This is the message of, uh, of the Perasha. To remember that, yes, I want to give kavod to somebody. And I want to help you. And I want you to go into the house first. But if there's people cold, if there's people that are going to be freezing now in the room because me and you, right, are now discussing, I have to, I have to answer a phone call. I have to say something. But yeah, you know what? But there's someone that's listening that's not going to appreciate me speaking right now. I got to be sensitive to that. I got to be sensitive to all of these different values. One is important, but it doesn't mean that I completely chuck the other one out the window. That's not what we want either. We should be zocher to have this balance of all of our values, to remember that Torah is important, but also the other values that come at the expense of Torah, we should try to accommodate them as much as possible, whenever and however the halakha tells us to do so. Wishing everybody a Shabbat Shalom, Gorach. We'll see you next week. Shabbat Shalom.